I'm Marty Mulligan from Mullingar. You're all very welcome here to the Hill of Ushna, seat of the High Kings, the resting place of the gods. We're in the very sacred centre of Ireland. This site goes right back to the Ice Age. From the Ice Age, we go on through the Neolithic period, up to the Bronze Age, Iron Age, medieval period to the time of St. Patrick, right up to today. Because this ancient site covers all of the ages. And it's here that the gods of ancient Ireland, the gods of the two who did down and rest, Eru, Mother Earth, rests here, from whom Ireland gets its name, Era. She rests underneath the catstone. And the catstone, also known as the Stone of Divisions, was set to mark the exact centre of Ireland, the place where the provinces of Ireland meet. Lu, the sun god, rests here. So the resting place of the gods, seat of the high kings, and the place of assembly for all of the tribes of Ireland. To join me in this journey, we'll take you back in time to this most ancient of sacred sites. The first part of our journey takes us here to the ancient palace. And it's this part of the site that was actually heavily excavated in the 1920s. We know quite a bit about this by R.E.S. McAllister and Prager. I think it was over a five year period that they dug. The palace is a conjoined ring fort. In Ireland, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of ring forts. There are ring forts everywhere. There's ring forts, fairy forts, and I'll get back to them, and more ring forts, but there are only a handful of conjoined ring forts. The conjoined ring forts are two circles. So we're in the larger circle here, the smaller circle, the western sector is just there. And they're conjoined, the figure of eight, Tara is conjoined ring fort. Each of the provinces have these figure of eight forts. If I look that direction, I'm looking east. So the royal site of Leinster is Dunalin. And to the north, you have Almaca, Navenport. To the west, Rakron. And to the south, Cashel. Directly behind me here is the ancient ceremonial road. This journey excavations. I found the remains of the house just here and the ceremonial road, this ancient road. In each direction, a road would lead from each of the different provinces. This is the fifth province, the province of Mid, the kingdom of Mid, the Middle Kingdom. So Loch Ennel is just over here. And King Malachi lived there. The kings lived on the lake and this is their ceremonial place, their, their meeting place, the place for the great powwow that was held here each year at Bialtana. Entrance to all of the royal sites faces east because your first god, the sun, rises from the east. You see, Ocean is a royal site. Tower is probably the most widely known of the royal sites in Ireland. Cashel likewise as well. But Ocean is the central royal site, right in the centre of the country. And it's now on tentative lists to be a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. All of the Royal Sites of Ireland together um, have been put forward by the government to be a possible World Heritage Site. Because where we're standing and where I am right now, looking back at the ceremonial road, and it gets me every time, a thousand years ago, people stood here and they looked at the very same thing, a thousand years ago. More trees, but apart from that, the very same thing. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was in Nazareth, people stood here looking at the very same thing. More trees, with the very same view, listening to the very same sounds, feeling the very same cold air blowing on them 2,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, people stood here. And 4,000 and 5,000, because this site goes back to the Neolithic period. 10,000 years ago, for fact, no people stood here because 10,000 years ago there was no Ireland. It was the Ice Age. Behind me is the ridge that runs all the way through Ireland. And that's the Escarida. 10,000 years ago the ice melted and the glacier came and carved this whole way from the east all the way down to the west. It carved out this valley just below us here. And that's the Escarida, the ice road. And once the ice road and the ice cleared, went off into the oceans. Then people came. So 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, give or take a couple of weeks, on a Tuesday afternoon, about four o'clock, 
first people arrived. <laughs> yeah, who's to say that it didn't? We don't know. But what we do know is that this ancient sacred site has been in use since the Neolithic period because we have evidence of it. So the royal palace, the ancient palace, seat of the high kings, and look around you, exactly as it was all those thousands of years ago, nothing has changed. So we're taking a quick detour from the palace um, on the way to the Neolithic period and to all of the ages. And I just had to stop at this tree. I love this tree. I love all the trees, but I love this tree. This is, um, oh, it's regarded and known as the fairy tree. I never really called them the fairies, but this one, the white hawthorn, it's a very special tree. To me, it was always, they were always referred to as Nishi and a Dinawa good people, the ones who were sent underground, the two Hidadanan, who lived in the mounds and the fairy forts. Why I refer to this as a fairy tree, it's a white hawthorn. Now white hawthorn, they're all over the place, but when you see a, a tree like this with rocks underneath it, that was always said to be a place of assembly, where the Dinawa, the she, fairies if you will, where they'd sit around and meet at night time. And that's why the rocks underneath are all different shapes and sizes and all of that, because they're all different shapes and sizes. And, I don't know, like the whole thing with the fairies. The trees, the white hawthorn trees are about protection. They protect the Dinawa, the she, and we protect the trees. So these trees are very special. If you gave me one million pound and a helicopter and a huge big car, like a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes or a BMW, and an apartment in Lanzarote or Timbuktu, and you said all I had to do to get all those things, and you gave me an axe. If you said all I have to do to get all of those things is chop down this tree, I'd be handing the axe straight back to you. And I said, Go off with yourself to Timbuktu because nobody that I know would chop down one of these trees. And I'm not saying, but nobody I know would chop down one of these trees. I'm not saying bad things would happen, but nobody I know would chop down one of these trees. These are the white hawthorn trees. And they're protecting the sheep, we protect the trees. And if nothing else, isn't it just about respect for nature and itself? They're a beautiful tree. Why would you ever want to knock it down? I wouldn't. So, I just mentioned the two of the Danon who are sitting by the fairy tree. And this is Eru. Eru is the goddess, the earth goddess. And it's from Eru that Ireland gets its name, Era. And Eru is a triple goddess. The ancient people of Ireland saw Ireland and the land as a living, breathing mother. So Eru being the triple goddess is Eru Fodla Bamba. And what it represents is the three stages of woman. Bamba is a beautiful young maiden who comes alive and wakes up at springtime. At this time, Bamba. Eru is now Bamba. And Bamba, the beautiful young maiden, the planting is done, and the seeds are sown in the beautiful young maiden, and then she becomes Eru, which is the woman with child. And from there, during the harvest season, she becomes the mother. And during the cold winter season, she becomes Fodla, the old woman of winter where you rest and nurture. In the springtime again, the cycle continues. Back to Bamba, Eru and Fodla. So Eru, Mother Earth, as the ancient people saw it, rests here at Ushna. And that makes it a very sacred place. Throughout the world, you have sacred sites where the gods rest. Well, here in Ireland, Eru, Mother Earth, rests here. And Lu, the sun god, rests here. So from Eru, we'll go to Loch Lu, the place where the sun god Lu was said to have met his mortal end. A lake that goes back to the very ice age, some 10,000 years ago. And we're here at Loch Lu. This lake, 600 feet above sea level, 
and some 10,000 years old. 10,000 years old. Back to the Ice Age. It was formed in the time of the Ice Age. But its name is like Lu. Lu is the sun god of the two of the Dana. We just met Eru. I'll talk a little bit about Lu. It was Lu who defeated Balor and the Fomorians at the Battle of Moitura. And he was the king of the two of the Danon. The two of the Danon, the gods and the goddesses of two of the Danon, from our stories in mythology, but this is their place. And it was here that it said that Lu met his mortal end. The King of Ireland had been slain by the three sons of the King of Leinster, Machill, MacArthur, and MacGrania. And to say, so the story goes, it was all over a woman. See, Lu, his wife, um, was said to have had an affair or a dalliance with Kermit, the King of Leinster. Lou was terribly jealous of this. So Lou, in a jealous rage, went to Kermit, challenged him and confronted him about the affair with his wife. And he killed him. He killed the King of Leinster, Kermit, who was son of Dagda, the good god. Lou, being a god, the King of Ireland, had shown his flaws and his failings. He should not have killed Kermit. And he should have not have risen to the, the jealousy that was in him. So his anger and his jealousy led to the death of the king. And Lou came back here. And it said around the time of Bjaltna, all of the, the great events um, are marking times, different times of the year. But at Bjaltna, Lou, the sun god, the king, the leader of the two hit the Dan, standing right here at the shores of the lake. And the three sons of Kermit came to seek revenge for their father's death, Machill, MacArthur, and MacGrania. They came from the east and they stood just there, saw Lou standing right here, and MacGrania. MacGrania was the greatest spear thrower in Ireland, and he picked up a spear and he fired it. And he fired it and it stuck into Lou's foot and pinned him to the ground. And then the three of them ran at Lou, and they picked him up and fired him down into the lake and they drowned him in front of all of the people. And all of the people were devastated because Lou, their son God, was taken from them with three of their own. It should never have happened because they were good guys too. Jealousy and revenge. So Lou was taken from the lake and just over there is an early Bronze Age cairn, Cairn Luda. And I said it's there that Lou, the son God, was laid to rest. This lake, Loch Lou, turns into a place where people would come to pay their votive offerings to the sun god, Lou, 10,000 years old. Well, we've made it to the highest point in Russia. We're now 602 feet above sea level. And it's from this highest point here that you get the whole feeling and the idea of being encircled by the country, by the whole of the country, because on a clear day, 20 counties are visible from this very spot. And today is not a clear day, but still I can see Dublin mountains, I can see the Wicklow mountains, I can see off down into Offaly, I can see into Carlow, Kilkenny, Sleep Blue Mountains. Sleeve, Sleeve Le Mans down in Tipperary, over to Nina, way west, over as far as the Burren and Clare is visible. And up onto Sligo, Leitrim, Cavan, Armagh, over to Loch Crewe, in County Mead, Tower is just up here, Dublin straight ahead. So it's that idea and that feeling of encirclement. And it's here, on this very spot, that over the past, well, 10 years or so, that we've been lighting the Bjeltina fires. And the fire was to mark the beginning of the summertime, the beginning of May. And tribes from all of the provinces, I'm going back in the day, from all of the kingdoms, from Leinster, Connacht, Munster, Ulster, would all meet here in Midda, the fifth province, the fifth kingdom. 
the Kingdom of Midda. The Kingdom of Midda is from, what you can see this direction, all the way up to the coast. And it's the fifth kingdom is, well, it's this physical province of Midda. But the whole idea of the fifth province was that it's this meeting place where all are equal, all the tribes are equal, they all meet here in peace. Tens and tens of thousands of them will come to light the Bialt in the fire. It said that the very first fire that was ever lit in Ireland was lit here. Um, so it goes right back to the very beginning. From this fire being lit, all fires throughout Ireland were lit. So the, where we are and being 600 feet above sea level, See, the Midlands is all flat lowlands and throughout there are these undulating hills and elevated sites. And then the fire is lit here. When the fire is lit, that hill over here lights its fire. That the hill lights its fire. And the fires are lit continuously once this fire is lit. So they all see this fire and then from there it spreads and spreads and spreads throughout the whole country. You can imagine here filled with tens of thousands of people. Going back to thousands of years, it's said to be the oldest festival in Europe, the oldest known. And it was a, an, an assembly, a gathering, a, a fair, the Enoch was held here, a fair at Ushna. A time of fertility, because Mother Earth is now with child. So the celebrations were held, and the greatest celebrations of all were held right here. This year, of course, because of our changed ways, um, the public fire will not be held. The fire will be lit. The fire will be lit by the Clark family, as it was in 2020 in previous years. This fire has been lit by Uktarana here, and Michael D. Higgins came here a few years back to light the fire. And it is such an occasion because it literally marked the beginning of the summertime, the celebrations associated with the summertime. Looking around me, and again, looking at almost all of Ireland, looking at 20 counties here. And it's like Ireland is at peace. It's like it's resting, it's sleeping. It's so quiet and it's so still and it's so beautiful. We live in a very beautiful country. And just over here is a Neolithic chamber, which is actually known as St. Patrick's Bed. It's said that St. Patrick held his worship here and it was his place of worship. Well, I can see why looking around me. But it's actually a Neolithic chamber, which predates St. Patrick by thousands of years. This one probably goes back four to 5,000 years BC. And the chambers throughout the whole country, there are more Neolithic chambers and sites in this country per square mile than any other country in the world. This is all dating back to, as I say, before the pyramids, back before Stonehenge back to the first people who, with their knowledge of astronomy, that they could then figure out the Earth's rotation by building these sites to mark the exact rising of the sun at a particular time of the year. Newgrange will always mark midwinter solstice. Loch Crewe will always mark spring equinox. The sun will always rise at this point. So those were the times when the people would gather and celebrate. The Ushna has always been regarded and referred to as the sacred centre of Ireland. And directly behind me here is the very reason that this site is recognised and thought of as a very sacred place, because this is the Cat Stone. The Cat Stone it's, it's just like a, a nickname for it. Um, some people can see the shape of a cat. And there's his head and his hindquarters behind him. I'll show you when we get closer to it as well. But its proper names are, and there's many names. One name is Oil Namarin. Oil Namarin is a stone of divisions. And oil is a stone and Namarin is a division. And it's said that this stone of divisions mark the very centre of Ireland because it's here that the provinces of Ireland all meet. Now, it's a glacial erratic. The significance of it and the sacredness of it relates back again to Eru, Eru Mother Earth. 
Eru, where Ireland gets its name, Eru from. Well, it's Eru that rests underneath the Catastone. Now, the stone itself is a glacial erratic, and it's known worldwide as an umfala stone. James Joyce referred to it as an umfala stone. Umfala stone are found throughout the world. Delphi in Greece is probably one of the best known. In Peru, is umfala stone. Different points throughout the world are umfala. And the umfala, what it represents is that it's a navel stone. So it's the navel. And this is regarded as being the navel of Ireland. So Peru, Mother Earth, rests here underneath at the navel of Ireland. And we'll take a journey down to this very, very sacred place, um, to the centre of the world, to the centre of the universe, perhaps. So we've made it to the final leg of the journey. I know it's impossible to show you all of Oshna and all of its magic in such a short space of time. But to give you just an idea of it um, and the importance and the relevance of it right through to today. Um, the cat stone here behind me is a glacial erratic, oil and mirroring the stone of divisions, umbilicus hibernia, the umbilical cord of Ireland and the resting place of Eru. You know, it's funny when I think of it as well, like I'm just standing here and anytime I come here, there's a sense almost of time standing still. It's like stepping back into time. It's such an ancient, sacred place. The sacredness of it is something I keep referring to, and this site has always been regarded as the sacred centre of Ireland. I have met people from all over the world, different indigenous peoples from all over the world here. I've met so many Native American peoples. I've met Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Sioux, Apache, Blackfoot, I've met people from Peru, Aboriginal people, I've met from Mexico, from Guatemala, I've met these peoples from all of these different indigenous peoples throughout the world who come here to Ushna purposely to connect with here, with this very place here, because they understand the significance and the relevance of it, because in their cultures, their ways and their ancient ways would be the same as the ancient ways of the people here. They had Mother Earth, the Sun God. Their gods were gods of nature. Everything that they did was nature and looking after the Earth and taking care of the Earth and working with the Earth and working within the seasons and understanding the very nature of all that surrounded them. So knowing that people from the different cultures throughout the whole world know of here and come here has never ceased to amaze me. And then you get talking to these people and they tell you their stories and their ancient stories and from their mythology, so similar to our stories and mythology that there has to be this connection. And there is this connection. And people come here and they make that connection. It, it's, it's a connection that I feel every time myself. You're connecting with the earth. Um, it's ancient, sacred place like this that people have been coming to in thousands of years. To me, I don't know, but to me, I find something very peaceful and very calm about it, knowing that it's been here for thousands of years and been protected and guarded as it is and kept for future generations because sites like this are so important. They, they tell all of our story here in Ireland, our whole story in, in one tour of here. Um, we'll take in all of the ages and all of the different people who came through Ireland and become places of assembly and places to gather and to understand more about our past and from there maybe we'll understand more about our present and our future as well because this is from the past. This has been here 10,000 years. It's going to be here another 10,000 years.